anthracycl anthracycl anthracyclines today and you know that's it's a little bit of a a selfish thing on on my part because i've worked with these drugs for 30 years um and uh and and know a fair amount about them so it made made it easier for me to to put this lecture together but i do think that you know for for drugs that are i i tried to get the numbers you know they estimate that a million people a year get get treated with with anthracyclines for for cancer and it's certainly one of the most if not the most uh, broadly used agent on the veterinary and veterinary side as well um for both uh, sarcomas and carcinomas as well as as lymphoma and so you know the these drugs are are so broadly used that i think that you know talking about them and and kind of going back and and you know talking about the history and, and where they came from can really teach us some lessons uh to those of us you know involved in in drug development today and, and i'm going to end um this lecture with talking about um, actually, people are still pursuing new anthracyclines, which um, was, you know, I was a little surprising to me because I, I actually hadn't followed that literature all that, all that much. But you know, there, there's still this um, uh, idea that that this drug class isn't isn't dead, and we'll um, talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, but um, you know, I think uh, you know a, a, a little bit of review of of the drugs that that are in our toolbox. Um, where they came from, and and you know, because I, I think we have a tendency to ignore them. Um, we, we ignore what's what's there. So anyway, without further ado, um, I'm going to share my screen, and um, we'll start we'll start talking about um, the uh, the anthracyclines. Okay. So, you know, I, I think the first thing is, is, is what they are. And, and an anthracycline is, is best, basically an anthroquinone um, added to a, to a non-aromatic ring. And so, um, and, and when, you, when you look at the structures of these drugs, and these are the, the most broadly used uh, anthracyclines, uh, doxorubicin, uh, donorubicin, epirubicin, and idorubicin. You you can see that you know they they have that that anthraquinone structure and then this this other ring, and um, and some other moieties, and I think the other thing to look at is, is how similar they are to each other. Um, you know, doxorubicin and, and donorubicin only uh, vary by um, a, a methyl versus a, a methanol group on one of the side chains, and um, epirubicin actually has um, an OH going. A, a different way on on the sugar um, as opposed to doxorubicin and idorubicin, um, you know, has some some minor changes as well um, in terms of of some some changes in orientation of and 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 loss of the the methoxy group on the 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 D phenyl ring. So the, these compounds are are very structurally similar, and um, and the reason I bring that up is um, you know. A lot of these drugs were, I mean, Dox and Donorubicin are the are the the parent drugs, and and I'm going to talk about about Dox today. And when I talk about Dox, I'm really talking about the whole class. But I remember when Epirubicin came up came up, it was um, talked about as a cardiac sparing um, anthracycline, and you know one that that had less uh, uh, cardiotoxicity. And and we'll kind of touch on that when we get to the PKPD, um, and certainly at at the end when we talk about about some of the new anthracyclines but you know that has been the holy grail how do we make an anthracycline that has has less cardiotoxicity and that has really been the driving force for the development of these drugs over the last 50 years and and the reality is is we haven't got there um and so just kind of a to to throw the 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 ending story out that has really been you know what what people have have looked at for these to, to try to do with these drugs and, and that's where a lot of these these other agents have been developed and where a lot of kind of combinatorial or, or other medicinal chemistry is focused on these drugs now besides the anthracycline ring there's there's a sugar component and the interesting thing is that 
the sugar component is critical to activity as the aglycone form has been shown to be uh, much less toxic and does not accumulate in the nucleus. So although we, we think about the business end of the molecules being the anthraquinone and that, that kind of um, planar structure, whether it interacts you know, in, in the minor groove binding DNA or this quinone um, as, as an electron acceptor, as, and you know, as we start talking about the mechanism of action of these drugs, um, it's really interesting that the sugar really seems to play a very important part in getting the drug where it needs to be uh, to be effective. So the glycosidic component or the, uh, the donosamine sugar uh, is, is critical uh, to its activity. Okay. And so it's not just the, the anthracycline, the anthraquinone group. Um, it's also that, that sugar moiety. So those both really need to be there for the, for the activity of the, of the anthracycline molecule. Okay. So I went into this and I, you know, I was like, well, should I talk about the history? And the reason I wanted to do this is because I think it's important that when we start thinking about these drugs to know where they came from. And as it turns out, they're the Instituto Researcia Farmitalia, which is basically the, the uh, Pharmacology Research Institute in, in Milan, had, had been doing a lot of work actually in the 50s on looking at antibiotics that come from Streptomyces strains, and they'd got them from all over the world. Um, and it turned out that, that the director, Dr. Bertini, and, and, and one of the faculty there, Dr. Uh, Canavazzi, were collecting soil samples um, near uh, a, a castle, the Castel de Monte in, in Andrea, Italy, um, and, and culturing strains. And, and they came up with a strain of Streptomyces that they coded as, as FI-1762 um, that was isolated in, in the summer of, of 1958. And what they started, what they realized quickly was that um, some of the isolates from these uh, uh, strains were really toxic and they showed strong anti-tumor activity against Ehrlich ascytic tumors in mice. And, um, and, and again, I wanted to, so that this, you know, 1958 doesn't seem that long ago to me. Um, I wasn't born yet, just so, so, you know, but, but it was, um, you know, uh, it, it's now what, 64 years ago. And what I wanted to, to show is that the science was really different back then because what this is is this is what's called bioautography where they actually um, ran a thin layer chromatography to separate compounds and then they basically put it up against a plate of bacillus just to see what was where you saw activity and these spots are where those bacillus were killed and those spots actually turn out to be donomycin and doxorubicin um, and so both of these came out of these these isolates um, and these were bioassays. They didn't have the type of molecular analysis. They didn't have the type of even cells back then, cell-based analysis, um, tissue culture, strong animal cell tissue culture to screen these things. And certainly they didn't even any, have any high throughput screening. So this is really much a bioassay that they, they said, okay, there's some, there's some things that get separated on a thin layer um, chromatography plate that um, are really good at, at killing um, in this case, bacillus strains of bacteria. So these are antibiotics. And this led to um, a lot of screening of isolates and chemical analysis that was carried out for the next three to four years. Here's a map. Here's where Andrea is. Here's where these the streptomyces strain came. Um, initial clinical trials were, were carried out in Italy at the Instituto Nazionale di Tumeri. Um, in Milan, uh, my Italian is, is awesome, as you can tell. Um, and uh, and it, it turns out that, that Dr. DiPietro and, and the people in Milan had close contacts with people at, at Sloan Kettering. Um, and they got very excited by some of the initial um, uh, trials. And so uh, trials in childhood leukemia actually um, started soon after with the first results published uh, in an abstract in 1965. And um, uh, Dr. Giuseppe uh, Canasinelli, who actually wrote the, the review where I got a lot of this information, um, had this in this paper here where he talks about the roots of modern oncology and the discovery of, of, of the anthracyclines. You know, he says, you know, as a, as a personal anecdote, in May 1975, while attending the annual American Chemical Society meeting in Philadelphia, I had the opportunity to watch on television among the participants at an NCI 
fundraising program to young people expressing their gratitude for having been cured of acute leukemia with donomason and for having been disease free for more than 10 years. And the reason I bring this up is these are, you know, a lot of things people talk about, about immune checkpoint therapy and stuff like that, where these amazing cures for people that, you know, weren't going to be cured before that happened with the anthracyclines. Um, and so, you know, and there, there were people and, and, you know, for cytotoxic, we all get a little bit negative, but there, there are a lot of people alive because of these drugs. And the reality is, is that, um, you know, that was back then, that was a, a very, um, uh, a certainly, uh, a compelling argument as to why these things should be, um, continue to be developed and be utilized. So when we talk about doxorubicin today, um, there's a picture of it. Most anybody that's worked in oncology knows it's um, bright red to orange. Um, and it's approved to be used, and this comes from cancer.gov, in, in humans to treat uh, ALL, AML, breast cancer, metastatic gastric cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma, neuroblastoma that's metastatic, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, metastatic ovarian cancer, metastatic small cell lung cancer, metastatic soft tissue and bone sarcomas, metastatic thyroid cancers, metastatic transitional cell bladder cancer, and metastatic Wilms tumor. You will not find another compound that has that kind of broad range of activities in both lymphoma, sarcomas, and carcinomas. Um, and um, so this, this is, uh, you know, one of the few broad spectrum anti-tumor agents. And this also carries over into veterinary cancers. It's used in osteosarcoma, lymphoma, other sarcomas, carcinomas, and generally considered the most effective and commonly used broad spectrum chemotherapy in veterinary oncology. So you know, from, from humble beginnings from the dirt outside a castle to, um, you know, use as, uh, as an agent that, that's, you know, um, become a really one of the major bullets in the guns of oncologists in both, in both the human and the, and the veterinary side. Um, and, you know, not without its problems as, as all the oncologists and people that use this stuff know, um, but, um, you know, it is, it does have a lot of activity. So, I think it's important how we found it, how it got there, all the kind of work. And, and I'm going to bring this up because, because I think it's important. It was, it was um, discovered based on its ability to kill tumor cells. And, and I think those types of phenotypic screens, you know, nobody really cared what else it did at that time, except it killed tumor cells. And then we had to find a, a lot about how to safely use it and other things it did, but this was just screened for its activity, you know? And, and that's interesting because that's how we used to do it. We didn't have molecular modeling to try to hit a target. And I think it's an open question in terms of, do we need to at least still use, you know, its, it's ability to kill as opposed to some mechanistic stuff as, as a way to get, you know, to, to drug development, because, um, you know, certainly um, this is an effective way to find those kinds of compounds. Now, one question that comes up and, and I bring this up, and, and, and I brought up the phenotypic screen before is nobody looked at mechanism. They didn't know what was going on. They just wanted to know the fact that this stuff could kill tumor cells. And so what I have listed here is, is the purported mechanism of actions of doxorubicin. And I think it's important to note that the first publication I cite here is 1975. The next one is the last one is 2012. And there's also one in 2013. So you're looking at a 40, what, or no, yeah, yeah, almost 40 year period, 38 year period um, of, of studies to figure out how this drug works. And I think that's important to note. And I don't know if we still know where all, it's, all of its activity comes from, but certainly we know it can inhibit DNA and RNA polymerases, okay? Um, is that associated with, with its ability to inhibit and interact with topoisomerase 2? very well could be in terms of causing strand breaks and then you cannot get complete you know polymerase activity because you have broken up dna we also know that it that it can generate reactive oxygen generation and the paper 
um, that, that cited from 1985 from Jim Dorishow, right? Who's the director of drug development at the NCI. So, you know, a lot of the, a lot, there's, there's a lot of people that worked on this drug that, you know, work on a lot of other drugs now. So Jim played a, a critical role when he was at City of Hope, as well as when he was in, with Snuffy Myers at NCI to, to really look at how docs worked um, and, and figure out that it, you know, it generates reactive oxygen and what does that mean? Um, you know, cell membrane surface interactions. Docs is really interesting because Tom Tritton, this is a paper from Tom Tritton who came from, from Yale and then was at the chair of pharmacology at Vermont for years. He showed back in the mid eighties that you could actually immobilize docs on a bead and still kill tumor cells with it. So it didn't necessarily need to get in the cell to kill. And um, so there's these cell membrane surface interactions that were studied. Did that involve NADH dehydrogenase? There's a lot of potential targets for that, but I think it's important to note. And they spent a lot of time making sure the docs wasn't falling off the beads, doing a bunch of stuff, you know. Um, and so it's really interesting that it can actually kill without even doing that. Um, it inhibits thyrodoxin reductase. Garth Powis studied that and what that meant in terms of redox and other, you know, reductive protein structures in the cell. Uh, it can alkylate DNA. And I bring that up because um, it's alkylation to DNA. Um, this is done, you know, by by a group in in Australia. It it involved formaldehyde, which can also be generated. And then this led to a whole series of drugs. And those of us here at the Animal Cancer Center and at CU um, would know these drugs as doxaform from some of the old ones. Tad Cook at Boulder was one of the pioneers in starting to try to develop these um, alkylating doxorubicin forms. We've done some work with them. Um, they, they really haven't panned out that well because they're highly toxic, um, but, you know, they know it can alkylate DNA, so it can actually form covalent bonds with, with DNA. Um, I'm going to come back to this mechanism of eviction of histones that comes out of some, some newer studies, um, but, you know, people have shown that can actually evict histones from, from, you know, DNA processes, and that can lead to changes in gene expression, as well as is instability of, of chromatin as you, as you don't have, you know, proper wrapping around the histones. And so this is a new, newer mechanism that, you know, came out about 10 years ago that came out in Nature Communications. And then a paper published in eLife about 10 years ago showed that you can get this ceramid dependent activation of, of CREB3L1. So actually, the DOCS actually enhances ceramid formation, and then that activates CREB301, which then um, has some downstream effects, including inducing apoptosis and a whole lot of other effects that are that are anti-tumorigenic. And so they're arguing that 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 plays some role. So I think it's important. What the heck does this mean? It means that doxorubicin is probably a broad spectrum cancer agent because it can kill tumor cells a bunch of ways. Um, and research into how this drug works is still going on 50 years after we started putting it into people. And it's actually more complex than this um, because of something I'm going to talk about a little bit later and the fact that, that it interacts with iron in very um, uh, uh, strong ways. It's very, very, um, uh, 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 has a high affinity for iron chelation. So there's a lot of things this drug does and, and that those multiple activities are probably why it's so broad spectrum. All right. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about, about some of the mechanisms that when we generally consider what DOCS does, I think everybody agrees it's a TOPO2 inhibitor. Um, and, you know, what, it, what TOPO isomerase does is untwist DNA. So then, you know, polymerases can get in there and, and, uh, and read the strands to make new DNA and make RNA. Um, and DOCS actually blocks the bindings. It sits in the minor groove. It, it blocks the binding of, of TOPO in the first place. But the other thing it does that's probably more damaging, and, and it shares this, this activity with the toposide, is it stabilizes, it blocks the ability of the topoisomerase, because topoisomerase breaks the DNA and then it passes one strand through and then it has to rejoin those ends. And so you have DNA stuck to both ends of the protein. Block, DOCS blocks the ability of it to go back together. And what that leads to is strand breaks. And so you get DNA strand breaks that can be lethal. And so this inability block docs basically stabilizes that broken form of the DNA. And so you get these strand breaks associated with this. So not only does it just block Topo's ability by sitting in the, the minor groove and acting as, an, as a kind of an intercalating agent, it can also interact and stabilize that, that broken form of the DNA with Topo, which can then lead to strand breaks. And so, um, and there's something also of note here. There's a compound here called 
ICRF 187. You probably know that better as a desrazoxazone or whatever, um, or, or Zenicard. Um, and I'm going to get back to this later again, because this is kind of a little bit interesting that it plays a role here. Um, and so that's, that's how it interacts and, and blocks topo uh, 2 and, and, and why we call it a topo 2 inhibitor. And I would argue that's probably a very significant contributor to its activity. Um, the other thing it does, and everybody talks about, and they'll just throw it out and says, DOCS generates reactive oxygen. And the reality is it does. Why? Because it's a quinone. It's an anthroquinone. And quinones are um, really well known for their ability to accept electrons. And we like that because the reason we like that is because um, this is what uh, ubiquinone does in our mitochondria. So coenzyme Q is a quinone and its job is to shuttle electrons. Well, DOX has a quinone inside that, that uh, anthroquinone, that anthracycline ring. It has this quinone structure and it's quite good at accepting electrons. And it can accept them from a lot of things. And you got to remember the cells throwing electrons all over the place with the oxidoreductase reactions to make various compounds, as well as the mitochondrial electron transport chain. And so enzymes that have been identified that can reduce doxorubicin or NADH dehydrogenase, like I said, that might be on the cell surface membrane and maybe why dox has these effects when it doesn't even enter the cell. It may be shuttling electrons around and, and just raising havoc on the cell membrane. NADH P450 reductase, that's not the P450 itself in the liver. That's the reductase form that accepts electrons to, to be involved in, the, in the, the oxidation reduction enzymes that P450 do. So this is also called cytochrome C reductase. But this, this we absolutely know, and Nick Bacher showed pretty clearly in the 80s, that this can generate hand electrons to doxorubicin, who then goes and hands them to oxygen to generate hydrogen peroxide and all the reactive oxygen species that we talked to them. Xanthine oxidase, xanthine dehydrogenase. This is the one I, I did my PhD on this enzyme in terms of its ability to activate, you know, anti-tumor quinones, which is why, you know, I have this, this kind of long-term relationship, so to speak, with, with doxorubicin. Um, and so xanthine oxidase, xanthine dehydrogenase, these things that throw electrons around when they're converting, you know, xanthine to uric acid and, you know, in, involved in, in hypoxanthine and adenine metabolism. Nitric oxide synthase can also do that. So anything throwing electrons around, DOCS is there to catch them. He's quite good at it. And the big one, the mitochondrial electron transport chain. Jim Dorshaw and Steve Ackman, when they were at City of Hope, made very significant contributions in understanding this. And they actually mapped where um, DOCS can actually get these electrons. And why this is important is that DOCS actually interacts with cardiolipin, which we're going to get back to in a minute, which is actually one of the major lipids in the mitochondrial uh, membrane. So it actually sits, it's, uh, it has an affinity for the membrane. It sits in there and sucks electrons off, hands them to oxygen. It generates all these reactive oxygen species. And if you take isolated mitochondria and you throw docs in there, it absolutely does this. And so, and they've kind of mapped where it can grab those electrons. And, and those papers came out in the, in the mid eighties um, or, or later eighties. Um, so yes, docs can inhibit topo uh, two, um, it absolutely can generate reactive oxygen, and I think those are probably two of the major things it can do, and those play major um, activities with, with, with why it does what it does. Um, but, but you can't discount the others either as playing some role in, with regards to, to its cardiotoxicity as well as its ability to kill tumor cells. And, you know, I got excited because I figured I could use an, uh, an Iron Man uh, cartoon in my, uh, in my lecture. So, um, and Docs and iron, and, and what, what, a, what is it about docs and iron? And if, if you just got bored and decided to go look at the structure of EDTA or desferoxamine or a lot of known chelating agents for divalent cations, including iron, you'll see a lot of structures that look like this. These um, lots of O's together to have lots of unpaired electrons sticking out to interact and chelate or to, to kind of to, to hold tightly but not bond covalently just to chelate and cage. Iron and DOX does it really well. It binds avidly um, to um, iron. Um, it can form a one-to-one, -one, a two-to-one, or a three-to-one uh, drug-to-metal complex. Um, and it has an overall affinity constant of 10 to the 18th. To put that in perspective, I looked this up. Ferritin has an affinity, and ferritin's job is to bind iron. Um, Affinity, the affinity of iron for ferritin is about 10 to the 10th. 
So actually, dox has a higher affinity for iron than ferritin. Um, and this can cause a, a lot of problems. Um, it can cause dysregulation of iron regulatory proteins. It can cause alterations in ferritin iron accumulation, and it can inhibit ferritin iron release for cellular processes. Um, and uh, this has been um, kind of indicated as a potential mechanism of, of dox cardiotoxicity, this dysregulation of iron um, and, and inability of the, 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 the cardiomyocytes to handle iron appropriately. Um, and, and it very well could be true. So this ability of, of docs to interact with iron um, is important as well. Those of you schooled in redox chemistry are probably thinking right away, well, now we got something that generates reactive oxygen bound to one of the, the ions that plays the strongest role in Fenton chemistry to generate hydroxyl radicals. That's true too. All of a sudden now you have uh, a, a molecule capable of throwing electrons around next to uh, another molecule capable of throwing electrons around. Does that facilitate you know, the generation of more reactive oxygen? And the answer is probably yes. And so, and the reason I say that is because people have done studies with, with DFO, des desferoxamine, ICRF-187 or, or desroxazone, which are all chelators those can decrease the toxicity of docs. So taking the iron away from it um, can make it less toxic. And so this interaction with iron seems also to play a significant role in what it does. So what about docs going into people? All right, so we talked about where it was found. We talked about all the little things it can do biochemically. What about its toxicities? And it shares many of the common toxicities, you know, common to, to cytotoxic chemotherapy. It has hematologic toxicities, leukopenia, bone marrow suppression, thrombocytopenia, um, although thrombocytopenia is, is a little more rare with, with docs. Dermatologic alopecia, um, it, it can cause, you know, urticaria and exanthema. Um, GI, nausea and vomiting, uh, stomatitis, mucositis, and a very well characterized and extensively studied dose-dependent cardiotoxicity, which we're going to talk about um, more clearly. Um, and it's also a severe vesicant causing severe tissue damage following extravasation. And, you know, any, anybody that's worked this known, you have to be really careful, you know, and they tried in humans, they use central lines, you know, dogs, you gotta, you know, you really need to have a, a, a clear line because extravasation damage is extensive with, with docs. So if it gets out of the vein and it sticks in tissues, um, you know, it's, it's going to cause damage. And this is actually one of the milder pictures that I found of extravasation damage with, with docs. So. It's a vesicant and causes um, um, pretty severe extravasation damage. So, you know, important here, causes most of the normal things. Cardiotoxicity is, is clearly key. And then this, this extravasation damage, which means clinically, you got to be pretty, pretty careful with it. Okay. All right. How about mechanisms of cardiotoxicity? Um, and the reason I bring this up is because in the 50 years we've been using this drug extensively, there's been a ton of studies using and trying to figure out ways to mediate and limit the cardiotoxicity. Can you separate the cardiotoxicity from its anti-tumor activity? Because that is really the holy grail and what you really want to do with this compound. Um, and actually, when I started graduate school, that was one of the things that I was doing, was working with antioxidants to try to separate the toxicities of these anti-tumor quinones um, from tissues to, to tumors. So again, I got a list of things that's been shown to do generates reactive oxygen species. 1977, some of the early, early studies showed that in cardiac tissue. Calcium dysregulation. It also can cause calcium dysregulation in cardiac myocytes. It does that by enhancing calcium-induced calcium release. So it actually, another thing it can do is interact with the riandine receptor and make it more sensitive to calcium triggers to dump calcium in the, in the, uh, from the SR. So um, another activity that, that it can do in terms of calcium dysregulation. Um, topo-2 inhibition of mitochondrial dysfunction has been um, a mechanism that people have talked about. Uh, oxidative damage to mitochondrial DNA, and these are they're all papers that, that support this. Iron accumulation in cardiac myocyte mitochondria. Induction of death receptors in, in cardiomyocytes. And this is a paper that came out in 2017 that showed that if you, if you treat uh, I mean, cardiac tissue with, if, if you, if that, if, if, if cardiac tissue is exposed 
to doxorubicin, it actually induces more death receptors and then responds to DNA fragments and trail and stuff like that. And you get apoptosis of cardiac myocytes, which is not good. So there's a lot of, again, holy schmoly, lots of diff different things. Um, and I'm going to talk about this one at the end because it's really interesting is topo two mediated DNA damage and histone eviction, they think as a pair causes uh, cardiac, cardiac damage. And again, I'll talk about that in, 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 at the end with some, with some new uh, anthracyclines that are being developed. So again, although there are multiple mechanisms postulated for dox-induced cardiotoxicity, in general, they revolve around DNA damage mediated by topo two, reactive oxygen generation and iron dysregulation. And I would think that those are probably the major players. Um, and, you know, but again, these other things, you know, may make docs special, you know, maybe a special boy because of that, you know, this induction and in, of death receptors, which makes cardiac myocyte apoptosis more likely and these other things that can happen, okay? Now, there's been, we've been looking at ways to mediate Doc's cardiotoxicity, you know, since I started graduate school in the mid, in the mid eighties and even before that. Um, and, you know, the, the one that's really come up and is used is, is dextrozoxane and it, it actually um, is called Xenocard or, or cardio, cardioxane. Um, and it's, it's known to be, be protective. And, um, you know, initially you'd think, okay, this is a, um, an iron chelator. And so it's gonna, you know, um, do this by blocking free radical generation which is what people were thinking when they first did this. It was always interesting to me because I knew that not all chelators did this because EDTA does not protect against docs induced um, oxidative toxicity. That was kind of danced around by saying iron chelated by EDTA could still redox cycle. Um, again, not always the most satisfying answer. Um, uh, Deferoxamine worked better, um, but you know, not great. And dextrozoxane kind of came out of some screens like I said, it was called ICRF 187 initially, um, and it works. But the crazy thing about it is it also binds to topo 2 beta and prevents anthracycline binding. So part of the reason, it, you know, that doesn't discount these some of these topo 2 methods um, in, in terms of, of, you know, it's not all free radicals. It's not all topo 2. Maybe it's both. And so, and, and uh, dextrozoxane is an effective a drug to be able to prevent this actually um, plays a role in both of those. And so it, again, maybe fits, you know, um, and, um, you know, dextrozoxane, I, I, I brought this in here because what I was talking about, it's interaction with topo two, but, but certainly it's ability to chelate iron was, was, was why it was developed. Um, the other thing about it, I think just to note is it, it is also a pro drug. It gets um, uh, hydrolyzed um, and actually the active, form is this ADR 925, which is shown here that forms this kind of cage around iron um, wh when it does that. So, um, you know, it, it, it's very strong iron chelator. It's gonna, gonna isolate iron away from docks. So maybe some of the other mechanisms involving iron, dex can also play a role in that. So um, dextrozoxane as a, a cardioprotectant agent to doxorubicin, it may be because it fits multiple profiles in terms of its ability to do this. Okay, so just something to know about it. It's not just free radicals. It also can, can block binding to topo two. Um, and it also can, can hide these, these iron um, particles and, and, and potentially sequester them to, to block some of the iron dysregulation that, that, tox, that docs can cause. Okay. Let's get into some pharmacokinetics and other things that docs does. So PK of docs, I broke this down just by add me um, absorption. It's dosed IV. <laughs> Why? It's a hell of a vesicant, so you certainly don't want to give it by, you know, um, sub-Q or IM routes. Um, not dosed via via oral routes, probably because it's probably going to cause some damage that way too. Um, it's said to have low oral bioavailability. I didn't really dig into that. Um, I would guess that's true because it's a substrate for a lot of the pumps that line the, the upper GI. Um, but, uh, you know, it's given IV. Um, it's, it, it's also dosed um, using a 10 to 30 minute infusion. And I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit. It, it's hard to find this, but what they found early is if you give it by a quick push, a two minute push, you saw more acute cardiac events. And so they really started to protract it to a 10 to 30 minute infusion. So not a long 96 hour infusion. 
And the reality is, is that they've shown that if you give it over 24 to 48 hours, you even get less cardiotoxicity or less acute events. Now, in terms of the long-term sequela associated with, with lifetime dosing, that hasn't been as well worked out. But certainly, um, uh, given it uh, in, in, you know, longer infusions and keeping the CMAX down um, does decrease acute events. And they found that 10 to 13 minutes can, is, is really acceptable to do that, or 10 to 30 it distributes widely to tissues with a volume of distribution in the range of 10 to 20 liters per kilogram. What does that mean? It means it's 20 to 50 times more concentrated in tissues than it is in the blood. This includes tumors. So it accumulates in tumors and it sticks there. So that's good. Um, it's metabolized by carbonyl reductase to doxorubicinol in the liver. Uh, it's also metabolized to the aglycone, aglycone form uh, hepatically and extrahepatically, so in the liver, but in other tissues. Um, and it may play a role in, in cardiotoxic effects and iron dysregulation, mostly the docs all form. All right. So docs all is thought to, to be, you know, a potential player in, in the cardiotoxicity, although certainly docs um, can, can hold its own in, in that right. So it's not all due to the metabolite. Um, elimination is primarily primary metabolism and biliary elimination. There's some renal elimination due to filtration. It, you do get some reabsorption. Um, and there is some active secretion that's been inferred because it is the renal elimination is greater than what you'd expect from just filtration alone. But so for the most part, it's eliminated in the bile. It's not peed out. That's probably good um, in terms of poisoning the environment um, and, and cleaning up wastewater, although in the feces isn't much better. Um, but a lot of it is metabolized. Okay. This is an interesting story to me. This is a, a figure I put together uh, a number of years ago, and it, it actually shocked me when I did it. Um, for for the veterinary oncologists here, they know that that dox is used at 30 mg per meter squared. You know, for the most part, in humans it's about 60, in kids it's 30 to 36. So, um, and and what I did here is this is just a graph of dox exposure following the end of infusion. Um, so just a, a concentration versus time graph. AUC is calculated. And the crazy thing is if you give dogs 30 mg meter squared and humans 60 mg meter squared, which we assume are close to their MTDs, they overlap. And so doses that give the same exposure seem to give the same degree of acceptable toxicity and presumably anti-tumor activity. That's reassuring as a pharmacologist. So if you get the same amount of drug in two different critters and it hangs out at the same time, you get more or less the same effect. Um, that that's satisfying. And so um, that's that's shown here, air into the curve, about 1,500 nanograms per mil times hour. Variability um, uh, uh, in interspecies, or I'm sorry, intersubject is about, you know, 25%. Um, and uh, the other interesting thing about DOCS is that it, it does have a fair amount of intra-individual variability. So you can give the, you know, same individual, you know, dose on day one and dose on day 21 measure PK and they can be different by 20 to 30%. So there's a lot of variability in, in PK and it's probably due to distribution and just water makeup, you know, hydration status. There's a lot of things for drugs that are highly distributed that, that can alter that plasma pharmacokinetics. But in general, exposure um, seems to be critical with regards to, to, uh, tolerability, which is, you know, these are the two doses you can use in these species and you get about the same exposure. Now, in terms of distribution and tissue levels, um, this is um, some, some work that, that we did um, now 20 years ago um, that uh, looked at docs distribution and modeling. And here in A is the plasma and you can see, you know, it's at, you know, basically between 100 and 1,000 nanomolar. Um, this is liver, um, I think gut, kidney, um, muscle, and then this is bone marrow. It has this, this slow uptake in bone marrow, which is, which is really interesting. It has to do with blood flow and, and what it sticks to. Um, but the, the, the main point here is if you look at the concentration of tissues, this is nanomoles per gram. That would be a gram of tissues about a mill of water. So that's nanomoles per mill. That's micromolar, okay? This is nanomolar. This would be a micromolar. So you can see that the levels in the tissues are roughly 100 times what you would see in the plasma. So highly distributed, okay? Highly distributed in, in all tissues. And it's not, doesn't really glom on to any, any one tissue in particular. 
goes down a little faster in the liver, probably because of metabolism, um, sticks a lot in the gut, probably because of DNA. And that's one thing that, that we were able to utilize um, is that it had been shown previously that DOCS distribution really correlated to DNA content. Um, and so we used that as a factor to predict drug uptake. And it worked, um, as, you, as you can see here from our predictions and the levels. Um, and um, cardiolipin, because like I said, DOCS binds to, to cationic lipids, and one of them is cardiolipin that's found in the mitochondria. So we're able to use um, uh, cardiolipin content and DNA content as a way to, to predict how much drug was going to stick in each tissues, and, and, and we got it to work, as you can see here. Um, the other thing I'll point out here is, is that there's two sets of data here, and that's why uh, Tina Colombo from the, the Mario Negri Institute for Pharmacological Research in Milan um, just to show that Milan's still involved in, in DOCS research. Um, Mauricio Diancalci had done some PK studies and he sent me the data and we used that in our modeling too. So it just wasn't our data. We were using outside data to, to show that this was a little more of a robust predictor of distribution. So DOCS sticks to tissues. It sticks in there because of DNA and cardiolipin for, for the most part. In terms of metabolism, I already touched on this. It's metabolized um, by these NAD pH dependent uh, aldo keto reductases. Carbonyl reductase is the one um, that's that's probably the best described. It's found in the liver. Um, and it, it reduces, all it does is it reduces this carbonyl here to this alcohol. And so that's the only difference between doxorubicin all and doxorubicin is, is this uh, reduction of this, this uh, uh, carbonyl here to an alcohol. And that does have some differences in activity. So subtle differences in the structure of these molecules can lead to differences. This is excreted in the bile. Some of it's excreted in the urine. Um, you can see low urinary excretion of DOCS parent drug, more high biliary excretion. Why it's pumped out by drugs like, or by pumps like MDR1, PGP, um, as it was called initially, which is, we all also know is responsible for a lot of its drug resistance and tumor cells. Um, and then you get the aglycone forms that are that are generally inactive that that go down from um, either the hydroxy, which means there's an OH group left here, versus the deoxy where there's no OH group left here after the sugars cleave. So those are the metabolites that that you generally see of DOCs, um, hepatic and extrahepatic with regards to the aglycone. This is basically a, um, all done in the liver, um, but a, a relatively simple um, metabolic cascade. Okay. What about PKPD? What do we know about DOCS exposure and how it works? And um, what we know is that um, you have cumulative dose and cardiotoxicity, that, that it's, it's, it's critical in terms of, of limiting lifetime exposure, and that's lifetime. And I'm going to show you a, a graph on the next page that, you know, kids that are treated with doxorubicin, when their kids are going to show cardiotoxicity when they're older, potentially, and if they get a secondary cancer, you can't load them up with doxorubicin. They have to start where they stop. There's a lifetime exposure associated with this cardiotoxicity. So um, that's a problem. In dogs, um, that's generally thought to be between about 150 and 240 mg meter squared, considered relatively safe. Kind of in that, again, same twofold range that we see in exposure. So not a whole lot of difference. Um, like I said, CMAX and cardiotoxicity. If you decrease CMAX, you limit toxicity. Um, acute cardiotoxicity. How do we do that? We do that by giving it by a little longer infusion from bolus to 10 to 30 minutes. And again, you can extend that longer and there seems to be potentially some advantages. And there's correlations between area under the curve and myelosuppression. Um, therapeutic drug monitoring may be used to predict this. Um, and there, you know, there have been some limited sampling models that have been developed to, to do that. How effective is that? It's really not that much of a problem because it's this is generally pretty um, uh, recoverable, um, but you know, on the, on the veterinary side, um, and, and I know Doug Tham's in on here, Doug's taking advantage of that to try to think about ways to actually dose escalate with dogs because we, we know that, that some of those neutropenia markers uh, may be predictive of, of response um, to, to CHOP protocol. So there's some reasons you may want to do that for, for efficacy reasons and, and stuff. So like I said, this is an interesting paper. This just came out, you know, two years ago uh, in JAMA Oncology that really looked at the, the kind of long-term sequela associated with, with, with kids, pediatric patients getting doxorubicin or uh, epirubicin or um, mitoxantron. This is important because epi and mito are considered cardiac sparing anthracyclines. Mitoxantron is not an antibiotic because it's a synthetic compound, but it is an anthracycline. It does have that anthraquinone structure. Um, 
And uh, the interesting thing about this is, is that um, they, they kind of followed up and, and, and you see, you know, the relative risk of, of cardiomyopathy in, in these kids, you know, it's about tenfold greater than, than, than the population that, that didn't receive that um, by looking at, at, you know, severe life-threatening or fatal cardiomyopathy uh, by 40 years of age. So um, some, some significant issues, like I said, that are, that are carried on longer in life. The crazy thing about this and the surprising thing to me was why I knew this about epi because I knew that data had panned out that it wasn't really all that cardiac sparing. People think it's like half as bad. Turns out in this publication, they say mm, it's, you know, maybe only 65% as bad. Um, and mitoxantrone, which used to be considered fivefold, it was a fivefold factor for safety. They say that needs to be reevaluated because mitoxantrone is the, the gold one here. Now, note that the doses are fourfold less here, but they say that that probably should be considered um, fourfold in, instead of fivefold uh, as, it, as it has for, for cardiotoxicity in, in these pediatric patients. So, again, you know, for these long term uh, effects, you know, looking out 40 years for kids, talk, you know, treated when they're 10 now, you know, you, we're only getting data from, from kids treated in the 90s now. And so it takes a long time to learn our lessons with these drugs, um, especially with these long-term effects um, that, that you see here. But I think it's important to note. Um, like I said, AUC and myelosuppression. Here's some data in humans that show that if you look at the, the, the white blood cell surviving fraction, it goes down as you get more drug exposure. Um, similar things uh, have been shown in, in, in dogs, and this is some stuff that, that Luke Wittenberg did um, when he was a, a postdoc on, on the faculty here uh, at CSU. And you can see the, you know, the neutrophil surviving fraction they were able to show. Now, we only went to six hours here, and the reasons we used a limited sampling approach to do this. Um, and, you know, we, we can get an interaction or at least show some relationship between um, neutropenia and, and, and um, docs area under the curve, which is refreshing because it's always nice to see that, that some indicator of, of drug exposure um, actually causes more of an effect. In this case, it's a, it's a toxic effect. Like I said before, this may be important in veterinary medicine because we may be able to use that neutropenia as an indicator that they're getting enough drug to actually see a significant effect on lymphoma. But that, that's a, a, a developing story um, that, that, um, that, that's, got, that's got some, some uh, room to grow. Um, okay, docs resistance. Most people, you know, it, the docs rubicin resistance we generally think about is induction of MDR1 multidrug resistance, one protein, or as it used to be called, P-glycoprotein, or as it's now called, ABCB1. What does it do? It pumps docs out. Um, there are alterations in TOPO2 that have been seen um, and decreased apoptotic signaling. Um, there's been you know, a lot of research on reversing doxorubicin resistance over the last 25 to 30 years focused on, on inhibiting ABCB1. And I think, you know, for the last 20 years, I've been asking my, myself, is this really such a good question or a good idea? I actually looked and there was a paper that came out just last year, a couple of them on new MDR inhibitors that may be more effective. And, you know, this, this gets down to a really, and I, I made this cartoon years ago. So I still like to use it because, um, you know, it seems easy. Let's block these pumps and we're going to reverse resistance to doxorubicin, you know, and Snoopy can figure it out, you know, uh, problem solved, cancer cured. We can give lots of doxorubicin. The problem is, is that, you know, 50% of dox is eliminated in the bile, the parent drug. What does that ABCB1? That's what pumps it out. And so, you know, you're really altering as soon as you alter. And this is some data that came from Riso Diancosti's lab in, in Italy, in Milan, with when they were really in the, in the, in the throes of developing these things, you know, um, 25 years ago, um, PSC 833 was one of these, these derivatives, a cyclosporin analog that was inactive that actually blocked P, um, P glycoprotein. <laughs> if you give it to mice and then you measure drug and their tissues, they're higher. Well, for a drug that's dosed at the MTD, having higher levels of drug are not going to be a good thing. And you're going to get toxicity. As soon as they went to the clinic with these things, and most of the studies that I know came out of the breast group at Stanford, the Brandy Sackick's group, they had to dose reduce both with Taxol and with doxorubicin as soon as they used these, these agents. Why? Because they got increased exposure. And for 
drugs dosed at the MTD, it's a no-brainer. So all you're going to have to do is decrease your dose, which is going to make the drug less effective. So this may not be the best strategy. And again, we're kind of, I think, beating on a door that's, that should have probably closed a while ago, but um, that's a different story. Okay. Now, we're going to end talking about the fact that the beat goes on. And in Science Health, and this came out about a year ago, um, I, I saw this new forms of red devil cancer drug could spare hearts. Um, and this came from some studies. Um, and like I said, this is the holy grail. If we find anthracyclines that are really good at killing tumor cells, but don't damage heart tissue, we can probably deal with some of the other things. Broad spectrum utilization of this drug <laughs> means that, you know, if you could control the cardiotoxicity and didn't have those long-term effects, man, it could be, you know, a lot better. And so they're still looking at those. This comes from uh, um, some work that, that came out of, and, and I'm not sharing all of it. This is, this is the, and, and, I'm, and I'm sparing a little bit here. I'm holding a little bit back. So I'm actually going to do another paper on this in our, in our journal club tomorrow. So those participants in here that are watching, I don't want to blow, blow all the thunder out uh, right away, but um, there's been some medicinal chemistry in this aclarubicin drug. And what the hypothesis that these guys came up with, and I've touched on this, I touched on this in the cardiotoxicity, is that they've got some data that suggests that the doxorubicin cardiotoxicity is, is, you know, due to the topa, the topo two alpha component, um, and that um, you know you need you need both of the you need topo two alpha um, uh, inhibition. Um, you know, like, and that was one of the slides I showed that desrazoxone can, can block. And so they think that, you know, that may be why it's cardiac sparing that the topo two alpha, um, interaction component is the one that's most responsible for cardiotoxicity and that histone eviction or this kicking histones off and, and causing changes in gene expression that can lead to, to cell death and causing, uh, chromatin instability. That's how it kills tumor cells. And so they're arguing that, you can separate these and they have this compound here, aclarubicin, which has two more sugars um, and an omethoxy up here um, and, and a, a little bit of a side change chain as well over here without with, with just uh, a methyl instead of a methoxy. So it looks more like donorubicin than doxorubicin. But, you know, the, the, the point here is that, you know, they're taking the anthracycline ring and they're making some more modifications and they can change activities, it seems, okay? Now, we'll see how this comes out in the long run, because I've seen this before with epirubicin and with, Don, you know, the cardiac sparing, and there was some, some other N7 analogs and some, some side chain things over here that people done, um, uh, you know, 25 years ago that were supposed to be the, you know, the bee's knees and the next thing that, that didn't pan out. So, you know, with anything, you know, I'm talking about, I just gave a lecture on doxorubicin, you know, and that drug was, was discovered and put into people you know, as, as early as 1965, which was the year I was born. So it's 56 years old, right? Um, and we're still learning things about it. I think that's the lesson, the take-home lesson for everything that we're doing with all the drugs we talk about now. We still learn something about um, Gleevec today, and it's 20 years old. It's a baby relative to doxorubicin. We're still going to learn new things about Ipi. We're still going to learn new things about nivolumumab, but we're still going to learn new things. It takes a while, you know, and FDA approval is not the ending. That's really just the start because that's the, that's the focus of the drug company. Now the rest of us get our hands on it and we can start <laughs> looking at what this stuff does that might've been behind the curtains. And I think that's the strongest take-home message I would give about doxorubicin is that it's relevant today because a hundred million people a year get it. It's also relevant in terms of drug development, because in general, we don't kill women with it anymore because we know how to dose it better. We have cardioprotective things, you know, and I bring that up because when I was a grad student, they said, you know, 1% of women are killed by chemotherapy that are undergoing adjuvant uh, chemotherapy for breast cancer. That was in the, you know, the late eighties. That's really not the case today. We think that number's a lot lower. So I think we're getting a lot better and learning still how to use these drugs over the time frame, how to optimize them, how to dose them right, what to put them together with um, is, is a long uh, story. So with that, um, I'm done. The next one of these is scheduled for March 10th. I would love somebody else to, to step up and, and want to give one of these lectures. 
Um, if you have any ideas, you can send me one. I can certainly come up with another one. And with that, I will gladly take any questions for a couple minutes. So questions. Nobody's got any questions? Is everybody asleep now? All right. Well, if no questions, if you come up with a question you have later, or you want to ask me something or talk to me, please feel free to send me an email. As you can tell, I like talking about um, drugs, especially old ones I know a lot about. Uh, the newer ones I still have to learn a little more about before I can ramble on as long. So anyway, 